damn it, how long have we been doing this show? The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life, it's episode 377. We're in the final week of June of 2024. I am Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. So for our uh, happy talk portion of the program this week, uh, you went to Orlando to see Blink One Eighty Two. How did that? How did that go? How were the? Uh, how are the boys sounding? The boys are indeed back in town. They sound great. Uh, I'm. I am not entirely convinced what we hear at, at that <laughs> concert is entirely their natural singing voices <laughs> at this stage of the game. I see, but. It is masked enough, and the overall uh, vibe of the show is strong enough that uh, it works. And it was a it was a great show. I had seen them live twice uh, previously uh, when they were closer to uh, closer to home in Baltimore, and then the next night when they went to Hershey uh, last year. And then I flew down and uh, met met up with uh, with a friend who. Uh, has also loved loved that band like I have, but has never gotten to see them live. It's a wonderful experience. They you know they play all the all the big hits everyone would expect. They mixed in some deeper cuts, and then they played the uh, title track on their newest album, and uh, fifteen thousand people uh, wept all at once, uh, and it was beautiful. Um, so it was uh, it was a wonderful wonderful experience. And uh, I was also delighted to be in like the younger age bracket of people at the show. So that made me feel good, too. Yeah, that, that never happens to me anymore. <laughs> Except maybe when I saw Paul McCartney. Yeah. Do we have a picture of Paul McCartney? <laughs> He's getting his own action figure. Oh, I'm sorry. That's an action figure of Angela Lansbury. Apparently. <laughs> yes, that is awesome. Well, there's some pro wrestling stuff going on. Uh, hey, the Wyatt Six finally debuted while you were in uh, in Florida. Mm-hmm. While you were at the Performance Center, <laughs> they uh, they debuted the Wyatt Six. Um, I would say minimal follow up this week on uh, Raw, but just um, thoughts overall on the uh, the debuts of uh, Nikki Crows. And uh, Dexter Loomis is on the Jinder Mahal diet. Mm-hmm. And Eric Rowan and Joe Gacy. And, uh, of course, uh, Uncle Howdy himself, uh, Bo Dallas. Uh, thoughts on that debut segment where they killed Chad Gable? I'm glad everyone had fun at work with their friends. And, uh, no, it's 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 dreadful i i hate this stuff um uh it doesn't fit within the context of what the rest of the show even the far from what many would consider traditional pro wrestling that wwe presents on a weekly basis it's so far removed from that when there's smoke machines and guys getting murdered and whatever else it's just it it doesn't it doesn't fit it's feels like a i don't know a youtube short film short horror film that somebody made and it's a well-made youtube short horror film you know impressive costume design a lot of creativity in that way um but the the content of it uh theoretically needs to work within the context of a pro wrestling show and um I, I don't see how that's that's going to work. <laughs> so it's not for me. And uh, it's uh, it's I don't I don't like I think everyone involved is going to do their best. I think uh, we could get to the, the the Bo Dallas Uncle Howdy sit down from this week's show in a moment. Um, I think everybody's going to try to will this. And I think. It will get their entrance will get a big reaction. Stop me if you've heard this before. Their entrance will get a big reaction when they come out, and then uh, 
the bell will eventually need to ring and we'll all remember why Bo Dallas hasn't been a featured act in uh, almost 10 years. Speaking ill of this act feels uh, sacrilegious somehow. Um, yeah. And and yet, I think all of your points are valid about how this doesn't fit with the vibe of the rest of the show. This doesn't work in a pro wrestling context. Um, these characters don't sell anything ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're supernatural. Um Yeah. Joe Joe Gacy also one of my least favorite wrestlers (laughs) of all time. I'll say you as a a habitual NXT watcher are much more familiar with him than I. Uh, I think when last I saw him, he was doing prop comedy in a cage match. Yeah, his character was a carrot top for a minute there. Mm -hmm. Is that is that super dated a super dated reference now? I think I think he still has like a residency in Vegas. I don't know. Okay. I, don't know, I don't know if there's been a more famous prop comic since him, since Carrot Top. That is a, a more current reference. Okay, good. I'm I'm nearing a milestone birthday here, <laughs> and uh, I'm concerned that all my references are out of date. But go on. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll try to keep that in check as we as we go. Then. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, the follow up this week after their uh, debut, where they laid everybody out, was. Bo Dallas had uh, Nikki Crows uh, deliver a, a VHS tape to Michael Cole, who doesn't know the word, the term VCR. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thought your point about them uh, trying to, um, they're trying to logic this thing out. So mm-hmm. they, they taped this, uh, inter- Bo Dallas taped this interview explaining why he's Uncle Howdy and uh, why the Wyatt six uh, are around. I, I I'm not entirely sure. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. It was long. It was a long interview. Sure. Uh, and, and that was the follow up. And uh, I don't know how you feud with this group. I don't know how this group fits within the context of a uh, simulated athletic contest. All of that remains to be seen. Um, are a couple of them going to go for the tag titles? Is I, I I don't know. I just don't know. There's so much we don't know still about this act after two weeks, and uh, I guess we need to let it play out. But uh, what did you? What were your thoughts on uh, Bo Dallas's uh, very emotional interview? Yeah, I mean he, he. That's probably the best performance of Bo Dallas's career, um, as far as like from a, an emotion standpoint. Um, they address the elephant in the room about how they addressed, but did not resolve in my mind, the elephant in the room. That is that they are in some ways exploiting the death of Bo's brother to try to create a, a act that kind of can siphon off the popularity that Bray had and put it onto this new group. Um, they did address that. Uh, you know, Bo talked about how it was the worst day of his life when when Bray died and all of this. And, you know, and it, it, like I said, uh, the, the the delivery was stop me if you've heard this before. The delivery was great. Um, but the content was uh, lacking in substance. And then, yes, it all no matter how good these little vignettes are or are not, uh, depending on what your cup of tea when it comes to sports entertainment is. Again, just all roads eventually lead to, yeah, are they going to feud with the Judgment Day? Are they going to feud with Legato del Fantasmo? And they're going to have wrestling matches with with the guy in the pig mask and and rabbit guy? Um, Like, hey, none of these people were doing anything individually on television. It's a chance for some of them to maybe get a fresh start. You know, glad Eric Rowan got his job back. Um, But it's it's just it's not for me and i feel like like with uh again it does it does feel tough and i feel i don't take a lot of glee in like i mean i like to poke fun on on twitter with a lot of this stuff admittedly but like, i don't i don't 
I don't take a lot of glee in being like, hey, this sucks and it doesn't work. Because, yes, I feel bad for for Bo Dallas that his brother died and that they were going to be doing something together just before Bray got sick and they're kind and they never got to finish whatever that was going to be the original uncle howdy and Bray Wyatt thing, whatever that was going to lead to, they never got to finish that story. Um, I can appreciate that. And I feel for the guy, but um, as a viewer of a product that is designed to entertain uh, a wrestling show, theoretically um, it just, does not jive with what I want to see on the show. So um, I don't know. Maybe they'll find a way to hybridize this. Uh, you would hope that the current regime is at least a little bit more malleable if something isn't working to kind of massage and and change some things along the ways to try to make it work. But uh, we'll see. Elsewhere, uh, we have a new member of the Bloodline. I think Jacob Fatu might have saved the Bloodline. Uh, this thing was becoming <laughs> very NWO 2000. Yeah. Uh, very um, uh, Vincent and Horace Hogan uh, feuding over the NWO black and white. Because I make a reference from 25 years ago and <laughs> wonder if my references are dated. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, Jacob Fatu is in. He did some time in jail for committing a robbery when he was a teenager. And uh, as a convicted felon, WWE stayed away from him forever, even though everybody was pretty sure he was the most charismatic and the best worker <laughs> yep. of um, all of the Tongan and Samoan clan. And uh, now he's here. He debuted by destroying Cody Rhodes, Kevin Owens, and Randy Orton. Not a bad way to, to start off your run. Yeah. Uh, he did a super impressive uh, top rope splash through the announce table. Uh, he has, mo perhaps most importantly, he has the crazy eyes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and a charisma that I don't think anyone else in the act currently, Paul Heyman aside, has. Uh, so, uh, Jacob Fatu, uh, and then he'll make his in-ring debut, I suppose, at, uh, Money in the Bank next weekend, where, uh, three members of this Bloodline 2000 group will face <laughs> Cody, Kevin, and Randy in a six-man tag. Uh, interesting. Interesting debut. Uh, I think everybody kind of expected that it was coming, and he may get a new name. Here on SmackDown this Friday, as uh, they've every time someone complains about the name, they trademark a dumber name. Correct. Uh, he could be Tala Tonga. He could be Longa Tonga. He could be Caesar Sokoa. Uh, there's several names that they've trademarked for Bloodline uh, Bloodline Act that uh, Jacob Fatu may receive a new name tomorrow, but they're on SmackDown this week. But uh, there you go. Uh, what did you think of uh, the debut of Jacob Fatu? Ha am I crazy? Has this <laughs> injected new life into the feud? Uh, is he clearly the most talented person in the group right now? What's going on? Uh, yes, yes to most of your questions. Uh, yeah, I think that is something that has been a disconnect for me. Um, and it's tough because Solo is kind of learning on the job of trying to be like a top guy. Um, it's not his fault they had him be the silent enforcer for like two years. And then all of a sudden Roman lost the belt and went home. And now he's got to be the star of the act. Um, so it's not necessarily all his fault, but when you look at solo, I have never bought into solo as like the crazy eyed killer. Um, and I buy that immediately when Jacob Fatu is on the screen. Um, like that guy feels like a threat. That guy feels like, um, what, yeah, like what you want for a, a guy in a faction like this, especially one that could eventually need to have like a top pay per view match with Roman Reigns or Cody Rhodes or whoever. Um, yeah, he's uh, he feels uh, a lot a lot more suited for that role. And on top of it, I would say that the whole point 
as we've talked about over the last couple of months, is that with Roman gone, the, you know, solos, the inmates are running the asylum. They're dangerous. They're out of control. And I just, I don't, I don't get dangerous and out of control when Tamatonga and Tangaloa are there. <laughs> like it's, it just doesn't feel dangerous or tough guys to me. I know they were in Bullet Club a million years ago and, and that group was really successful in Japan, but they just don't scream like tough guy, crazy, out of control. Everybody should be scared. But then you bring out Jacob Fatu and a lot of that goes to them treating him like that out of the gate too. He didn't show up and, you know, wrestle a, a squash match against Cedric Alexander, or whoever. Like he, he went in there and he beat the crap out of three tippy top guys on that show, the three top baby faces on the show, and he laid them all out. So, like, that's they did a good job of assisting him and making him look scary, but he played his part perfectly. So, yeah, I think, I think if you're trying to make a new group of dangerous guys and the whole idea that Paul can't control them. And 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 Cody's in danger uh, of losing his belt to one of these guys. That story is a lot easier to tell when you've got a guy as talented as Jacob Fatu there, as opposed to the other ones. And again, I don't say that to completely disparage Solo. I think I have disparaged Solo in the past. I think I told I said he needed to grow a foot if they were ever going to push him as a real main eventer. But um, like, again, I, I feel for the guy who's trying to find himself. And I think he has improved as a character, but he went from a blank slate to having to be a, t- a top heel on a show very quickly. It's not his fault. But Jacob Fatu, in one appearance, kind of outshined everything he's done t- to date so far. So, uh, yeah, I'd maybe be a little bit concerned about uh, getting leapfrogged right now if I were solo. Uh, but hey, Cody's going to need a lot of challengers over the, you know, between the SummerSlam and, and the rest of the year leading up to the, the Netflix debut. So uh, plenty of opportunity for both of these guys to get title shots at Cody. The rest of the build to Money in the Bank, I would categorize as uh, paint by numbers, a lot of qualifying matches, mm-hmm. guys winning qualifying matches, ladies winning qualifying matches. It's fine. Um, everybody really loved that SmackDown last week, though, where Fat, where uh, Fat Two debuted, and then uh, also had know. the the Punk Drew angle. They were in Chicago, another giant, giant Chicago crowd that uh, Phil was going to make sure he was on that show, obviously. And uh, they did the angle where uh, Drew laid out Punk and left him uh, bloodied, and uh, I guess to. Is that just to excuse Punk not being around for another month and they while they hope he's ready for SummerSlam? That's what I took it as, but um, you know, Phil hasn't been leaking anything. <laughs> he's been on his best behavior mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. over the last few months. So uh we don't we don't know. Uh I don't know. I that's what I took it as. I took it as oh, he was intimating that he's going to be cleared any day now, when really it's gonna be like six more weeks or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's what I took that as. But I don't know. I don't have any inside information on that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and as to the rest of the show, it's fine. Um, if patterns hold one money in the bank briefcase is going to be won by a baby face and one's going to be won by a heel. Uh, I don't know. The women's one, I feel like. I could see Chelsea Green getting a lot of mileage out of having that briefcase. Not that I would necessarily think she should be the champion, uh, but uh, feels like she's also someone that could cash in and lose if they just don't. <laughs> Sometimes they just decide they don't want to build a new star this year. Yeah. So that would be, if you were looking to put it on someone that could cash in and lose, that would probably be her spot. Um. So so the um the field so far... Are, uh, in the men's match, we have Jey Uso, who's the, really been the only one presented as having any kind of chance of winning it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carmelo Hayes, who uh, got a dumb pinfall over Randy Orton. <laughs> one of those nobody gets over specials. The Triple H, uh, Jeff Hardy. Yes, in the qualifying match, he rolls up Orton. <laughs> like, whatever. I'm not, I'm not advocating 
that Carmelo Hayes, who I am not a fan of his work, <laughs> I'm not advocating that he pin Randy Orton clean in the middle. Sure. It's, it was just one of those finishes that really stands out. It's like, oh, well, well this didn't help either guy, and it probably hurt both guys. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> like, why would you do that finish? <laughs> why, would you, why would you do a finish that didn't help either guy and hurt both of them? I don't know. Uh, Andrade, Chad Gable, there's uh, two spots left in that match. One will be uh, either LA Knight, Logan Paul, or Santos Escobar. And the other will be Drew McIntyre, Ilya Dragunov, or Sheamus. And then, um, yeah, I think Jey Uso is winning that one. And then so far in the women's uh, Money in the Bank ladder match, we have Io Sky, Chelsea Green, as you mentioned, Lyra Valkyria. If they wanted a babyface to win it, Lyra is the choice. Mm -hmm. And then the spots remaining there are either uh, Candice or Aunt Candice LeRae, <laughs> uh, Jay Cargill and Tiffany Stratton are in one. Uh, final qualifying match, Blair Davenport, who has in fact made it to the main roster, uh, is in a match with Indy Hartwell and Naomi for another spot. And then uh, the final spot from the Raw Women's Division, either Dakota Kai, Ivy Nile, or Zoe Stark uh, will make it. So uh, I, th I think Lyra or Chelsea in the women's match, and I think Jey Uso in the men's match. Yeah, that, that all tracks. My other thought was Drew could get the briefcase and try to cash in and Punk could cost him again. <laughs> or, do that. Sure. or down the road. Or if they have their first match at SummerSlam, Punk can win that. And then you can keep them apart for a while and Punk can win the the raw belt off of whoever has that by then. And Drew can cash in on him and and you go to a rubber match where, okay, now they've both caused each other to have really short title reigns. So there's, you could, yeah, I would say Drew is the only other guy that stands out. And again, we don't know for sure that he's even going to be in the match. So, but that's the only guy of the names mentioned that I could actually see uh, winning it. I mean, uh, uh, LA Knight, also a guy, if you were going to, it feels like, people have settled into him as like a U.S. title guy. Um, doesn't feel like there's quite the hunger to see him rise up to the top of the card that there was a year ago, but... I think I think they've tried and succeeded in cooling him off. <laughs> yes, I think... <laughs> I think... Uh, and part of that is because you have such a massively over baby face at, at, in, in Cody at the top of the show right. that he is on. So it's like maybe that was part of it too, of just the hunger of wanting to see somebody break through as a top baby face against Roman last year. But yeah, he is, uh, he's feuding with Carmelo Hayes. So he's, uh, his, his stock has fallen a little bit. I doesn't feel like there's quite the same hunger for him, uh, to be a, a tippy top guy as there was. I, I think he might beat Logan Paul for the U S title at SummerSlam, mm -hmm. which is a fine spot. Absolutely. Uh, for a guy who was, you know, in the NWA not long ago. Yes. <laughs> a guy who was the male model manager. Uh, yeah. He got called up. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And uh, and look, they don't hand out uh, pinfall wins over Logan Paul. So sure. that's kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah, that would be. I think that would be great. It would be a marquee featured match. Uh, and yeah, he could he could win the title there. So that would probably be a really good spot for him. Elsewhere on this uh, Money in the Bank card, we mentioned the Bloodline six man tag Sami Zayn versus Braun Breaker for the Intercontinental Championship. Uh, Braun Breaker shouldn't lose for possibly years. <laughs> they, they're accident. I don't know if it's accidental. <laughs> they're making a Goldberg. Like, yeah. He's just running through guys. And it, uh, I mean, he's not winning in two minutes like Goldberg, but like the crowd's more and more behind him every week. He wins every week and he beats everybody's ass. And he's just a guy who kicks ass. Like it's it's the it's the most like simple, easy to digest pushed character yes. in all of the World Wrestling Federation. And it's really good and it's working. So it's cool. It's cool to see that that can still work even on a modern WWE audience. Like they like they just picked a guy and they're going with them. And now it's their job to not screw it up over the next uh, six to 12 to 18 months. 
Have you noticed they gave him knockoff Ultimate Warrior music? Oh, they did change his music, didn't they? Yeah. Yes, that's that's pretty. That's a good, I didn't necessarily connect it to the warrior, but that's a good, that's a good call. It's a good shout. Um, yeah, he's 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 also. I think when I saw him in NXT, I thought what he was playing an intense guy, but I never really felt like he was a super intense guy. Um, sure, and I feel like he is growing in, again. Another guy who's learning on the job, but feels like every time. Every week when he comes out, he feels like he's carrying himself a little bit more of a of a star as as the crowd's getting behind him more. Um, and he's you know he's he's yeah he should he should win the title from Sammy and he shouldn't lose to anyone for a really long time. And uh, Seth Rollins is back. Our, uh, our good buddy, uh huh, freaking freaking came back, and uh, he's wrestling Damian Priest. And uh, for the fake world title, and with this, and there's stipulations if a priest wins, Rollins can't challenge for the title as long as priest holds it, and if Seth wins, priest leaves the judgment day. So, um, I'm not sure if there's stakes anyone particularly cares about, but there's stakes. So, uh, hey, they're trying, yeah. I mean, it's it's something, it's something beyond let us pretend this. <laughs> this world title means anything. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's fine. I, I, you know, nothing involving Damian priest since he's been the champion has been particularly electrifying to me, but, um, yeah, Seth, Seth's still very over and he's still a strong opponent. Um, so yeah, I guess, and I guess the judgment day is still very much the focal point of raw every week. Now it's more folk, flipped to the Liv Morgan and Dom stuff, but you know, so I guess Priest being forced out of that group would change that dynamic going forward. Um, and they had teased previous to I guess around WrestleMania, they were really teasing like uh, Finn and Priest being at odds, so maybe I don't know, if you want to really fantasy book it, like maybe Finn costs priest the match to kick him out of the group or something i don't know you could you could do something with that if you wanted to but um yeah i don't know it's 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 not a particularly compelling match but yeah at least those stips add a little flavor to it all righty well um what else do we have here we have uh nxt is uh has their heat wave show same weekend as Money in the Bank. Um, Obafemi versus Wesley for the North American title. Kalani Jordan versus Sol Ruka for the Women's North American title. Uh, Nathan and Fraser and Axiom versus uh, Chase U for the tag team titles. Roxanne Perez versus Lola Vice for the Women's Championship. And then a four-way, Trick Williams, Javon Evans, Ethan Page, and Sean Spears for the uh, NXT title. So that's what's going on there. NXT, um, uh, n- not been a great show the last few weeks, but so they did a battle royal where, uh, uh, what's his name won Lonnie Donegan won Lonnie Donegan, and then they did they just decided to do a four way anyway. I, my understanding is they kind of made it made sense because. Spears had pinned the guy and then Paige pinned the guy last week and then they had Spears pin Trick this week. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, Sean Spears pinned the world champion this week. Uh, and That's one way to run your company. <laughs> it sure is. And uh, the, the other way, the other way of explaining is after the guy won the Battle Royal, they uh, he like he didn't officially put the title shot up on the same show, but he kind of put the title shot up on the same show and mm-hmm. then lost. Mm-hmm. I don't know. The booking hasn't been great. The shows have not been great. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's uh, more content coming next weekend. Plenty of content coming this weekend <laughs> with the AEW X. Oh, wait, wait we should uh, touch on the old, old Dijak here. Mm-hmm. Dijak uh, wrapping up with WWE stuff. He says uh, WWE never negotiated with him and his contract <laughs> is expiring Friday. It's like his representation contacted WWE and tried to get them to negotiate and they 
stalled him and they just never they just never negotiated. So uh what do you know? Yeah, I mean he's he's another one of those guys that I would put like a Trent Beretta or somebody where it's like for all the things they can do athletically, you'd think they'd be more interesting as a performer, but they're just not. And that's always been kind of my feeling with with Dijak. I mean, several years back now, he had the matches with Keith Lee and NXT that people loved, and those were good matches. Um, and I liked the match. Was, was it a three-way with Obafemi and somebody over Mania weekend? Um, I liked that match uh, a fair amount. It was what, him and one of the other big fellas in a three-way. Um, but I I don't know Josh like, Briggs I believe oh there you go um Lonnie Donigan yes getting a lot of work on this show uh yeah and so it seemed like a guy that was well liked and worked hard and was a gifted worker but um not even really during Black and Gold NXT did it feel like he was a Triple H guy and then he got called up as part of the worst faction in pro wrestling history um and then got sent back to nxt and dyed his hair black and uh the rest was history yeah i mean i mean the part of the part of him saying that he wanted to stay and tried to negotiate and they just stonewalled him and then cut him or told him they weren't resigning him um is interesting in the sense that we have been talking about it all of these people's contracts have been coming up and they've all been leaked that all of these people are coming up. And I think the popular theory was WWE is leaking this because then they're going to resign all of these people and it'll be just, you know, easy PR win after easy PR win for them. But now with Ricochet, who maybe they wanted to keep him and he quit, whatever happened or didn't want to resign. But now, and then this guy who... You know, it leaked that his contract was coming up, but they just didn't want him. And so they, you know, left him on red. I was like, okay, so this is that adds a little bit of interesting spice to the whole why are all these contract details getting leaked all at once thing? If not everybody's going to be re signed or isn't about to be re signed, that's a little bit more interesting to me. Um, but as it stands, you know, Dijak is a 40 plus year old guy, he's younger than. Damian Priest, as someone pointed out, but he is he is not a young guy and he didn't really seem to ever have the faith of management beyond being a good hand. So I don't think it's surprising that they let him go. I just think it's surprising that maybe he was one of the names that was leaked earlier this year that everyone thought was, a you know, a slam dunk to stay. And it was apparently there was no interest from WWE to keep him. Here is a shoot 6'6 guy who couldn't get pushed in Vince McMahon's World Wrestling Federation, Mm -hmm. whose idea uh, for a character was to uh, put aviator sunglasses and a leather duster on. (laughs) Decided to start dressing like Marty Skrull. That was his idea. He's shoot 6'7, can do... uh, all kinds of moonsaults and yet hasn't been able to get a push in uh, the biggest wrestling company in the world. I am, uh, I am not going to blame the wrestling company for this. (laughs) I think (laughs) some people have it. Some people don't. It's a shame. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, I said, the, the, the part of them not pushing him, I think is right and correct. (laughs) For the most part, like they used him how I would use him. I would use him to teach big guys that I thought could be something how to work. Like that would be sure the extent of how he's been used the last two years or whatever that he's been back in NXT. Um, but yeah, I, like I said, the only interesting part of it beyond uh, is, is just the idea that he was one of the names that was leaked as being, you know, being his contract nearly being up. And it doesn't seem like he or anyone else involved ever thought he wouldn't just be re-signing uh and then they left him on red i'm like okay that's that's a little bit of spice that's a little bit of a spice to what would otherwise be a rather mundane piece of news of a guy they weren't pushing and didn't see anything in uh not getting a new contract 
All right. Uh, Forbidden Door coming up this weekend. <sighs> My God. <laughs> uh, I am not ready for another uh, six hour paper read this weekend. I'll just say that. Fair. Um, the uh, the main event of his show, presumably, uh, Swartz Strickland versus Will Ospreay. Uh, they did a Can They Coexist tag match on Dynamite this week. Um, I don't know what's going on with this. I don't know if Osprey's winning the title at Wembley. I don't know if he's going to go into Wembley as champion. And I I just, I have a million, I don't know what's going on with this. Uh, I'll say it that way. It doesn't feel like it's time for Swerve to lose yet. But it sure feels like that Osprey's the most pushed guy in the company mm -hmm. and uh, gets the biggest reactions. So maybe Osprey should be the champion. I I don't know. I feel for Swerve. I don't think um, he's been presented. Um, not to go all bully Ray on you here, but I don't think he's been presented as uh, as the world champion of a major wrestling promotion in uh, in his presentation since winning the title. That said, He's had a title for a couple months now, and uh, he's wrestling the most over guy in the company. So uh, a lot of different ways they could go with this. Yeah, I mean, the actual build of the match, I think they tried really hard, not this week, but the previous week, um, uh, which did a record low rating. We can talk about that in a couple minutes, but um, where they actually did a face-to-face -face promo and they both tried to get really intense with it. And... Um, I thought that was in the, a step in the right direction. I didn't necessarily love every line in that promo, but I thought that was a step in the right direction as far as building up. Uh, build The build itself has been pretty lackluster. Um, but to your point, they have now presented us with a world title match where no one knows what's going to happen and it doesn't feel like it's time for either guy to lose. So that does, that is one way to, you know, generate interest in your show is if you make a match between two guys and doesn't feel like either of them should lose. Well, Hey, that's a match. That's a, a bit more compelling as, and maybe people will want to pay to see the result of that. So um, the actual build, the week to week build, notwithstanding. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's an interesting and compelling match. And the match itself, I don't think anyone would expect it to be uh, anything but really good, if not great. So we'll see. Brian Danielson and Shingo Takagi in a Owen Hart Cup tournament quarterfinal match. They're doing the insane thing that uh, makes me want to pull all my eyebrows out uh, one hair at a time. Uh, but where they have... One bracket is already in the semifinals, and the other bracket is uh, still having first round matches. Makes me insane. But uh, Danielson and Shingo, uh, people seem to be excited about that. Yeah, that's a. It's not a first time ever match, but it's a a first time since either guy has been like a a world champion top guy. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a good it's a good match to put on this show and you have the Owen tournament. I think Danielson is one of two favorites perhaps to win the whole Owen tournament. So I don't think it's much in doubt who's winning here. Um, but yeah, Shingo's great. He's been doing King of KOPW trophy gimmick matches with Yano for like a year and a half. And it'll be nice to see him like in a presented serious you know, rest uh, wrestling match against a top wrestler. So that will be fun as a way, as a point of difference from a lot of his uh, presentation in New Japan over the last couple of years. The uh, the Young Bucks and Okada are wrestling the acclaimed in Tanahashi. Sure. It's a wrestling match. It's a wrestling uh -huh. match. MJF is wrestling Hechicero. What? <laughs> Pretty random. <laughs> like they kind of half tried to make it make sense in the sense that he like ran down to help uh whoever against and the, he and the gates of agony and everybody. There there 
The longer term plan is that they have set up something of a love triangle between Daniel Garcia, MJF, and Will Ospreay, um, uh, over who will who will uh, gain the hand of of young Daniel, and uh, and as part of that, that involved both Osprey and MJF coming to uh, I guess it was Garcia's age on on last week's Dynamite. And uh, and Hechicero having uh, allied himself with the Gates of Agony for some reason, uh, he is uh, he he and MJF are having a match. I mean, the obvious answer, the real answer, is it's in Long Island, and MJF wants to prove that he can have like a technical wrestling masterpiece, and that all of his main events don't have to be, or his big pay per view matches don't have to be uh, early two thousands walk and brawls and have a lot of shtick in them so i think this is a a point prover match for max is what this is even if once again as is often a theme here with our AEW pay-per-view previews the build to it has been uh not existent for the most part john moxley defends the iwgp world heavyweight title against tetsuya naito at forbidden door these two had one of the worst brawls i've ever seen <laughs> on dynamite this week <laughs> Both were being very careful with one another. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it made for a really bad brawl. Yeah, it wasn't a, it wasn't good. (laughs) It's also, yeah, that whole segment. I liked the six man match that they had, even with the crappy finish. But yeah, the post match of that was uh, pretty dreadful. And uh, yeah, we've talked about this. It would be unprecedented for the IWGP champion to not be in the G1, which is starting very soon. So this is probably the last chance for them to get that belt off of Knight, uh, off of Moxley and on to a new Japan guy. So I think Naito's winning the belt here, but uh, we'll see. Uh, Zack Sabre Jr. versus Orange Cassidy. Random match. Yeah, this might be the closest to just we picked two of our action figures out and had had a quote unquote dream match. It's a random collection of uh, just a, a, a guy from one company wrestling a guy from the other company. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's fine. Uh, it'll be good. There's going to be some kind of uh, match with uh, Jericho, Big Bill, Jeff Cobb. Uh, and Samoa Joe, Hook, and Katsuhiro Shibata. Uh, uh, the Learning Tree, his Redwood. The Bad Apple, Brian Keith, who's now wearing a sling for some reason. And uh, Jeff Cobb, 400-pound uh, man who could do a standing moonsault and uh, has boring matches. Uh, it doesn't do anything for me. The the learning tree people I think are have turned a corner though, and I think people seem to really like the learning tree. Uh, not me. <laughs> Would you disagree with that? No, I maybe I don't know. I I can't I can't gauge <laughs> how what? much of the uh, smart embo, uh, echo chamber online that. Uh, takes a dump on everything Jericho does mm-hmm. and uh, then the, you get the live crowd that uh, seem to be I don't know it's one of like several heel acts in AEW right now that is winking at the audience Yes, and it uh, doesn't do anything for me for that reason also I hate Chris Jericho <laughs> <laughs> look I yeah I mean it's not it's not for me uh, may, yeah maybe I know it's a constant point of argumentation between two very special groups of people on on the site formerly known as Twitter to argue whether or not his segments are his quarter hours are doing well because of him or not. If you like Chris Jericho and you like the act, it seems like you want to argue that that is the case and that, uh, yeah, we're just smarks in our echo chamber who don't like it. And maybe that's true. I don't know. Um, but I'll just say, as a fan watching the show and as someone who watches the show to analyze it and talk about it on this show, uh, I find it deeply uh, annoying and not in a, <laughs> and not in a way of, oh, I want to see him get his comeuppance from the babyface team. 
It's like, uh, you know, Shibata, Joe, and Hook being a trio is is kind of is kind of a fun deal. But the second they come out there to wrestle Jericho, I'm just like, oh, this is, this is death. I feel like I'm drowning. Like this sucks. Um, so <laughs> it's it's it's. I feel like I'm drowning. <laughs> it, just sucks. it just sucks when he's out there, man. And it's like every every line is something that he <laughs> he read someone critique him about on Twitter, or it's a a parody of something that people say Hulk Hogan said or whatever. Like it's so tremendously unsubtle, even by pro wrestling standards. Um, and it's just not it's not good. It's uh it's not it's not for me. Um, but I guess they also set up sometime after Forbidden Door, they're going to do Jericho versus Suzuki for the FTW belt, but not at this show. So, uh, sure. It, it, I, I, I don't understand. I really, I really don't understand any of the booking of this. I really don't. Anyway, uh, it's a disaster. The, the Tony Khan's booking and thinking is clear as mud. And you can tell that anytime they announce anything, anything whatsoever. Uh, Mercedes Monet versus Stephanie Vacker for the TBS Championship and the NJPW Strong Women's Championship. They've done angles in Arena Mexico for this. Mm-hmm. Stephanie has been on uh, Collision now. Uh, build. Uh, I don't know. It's. T- I don't think the build for Forbidden Door has been clicking because I don't think anyone cares about Forbidden Door as a concept. And it feels like the one of those old WWE bragging rights pay-per-views or one of those old, old uh, Raw versus SmackDown Survivor Series pay-per-views where even though they don't really push the New Japan versus AEW aspect of it and like New Japan guys are teaming with AEW guys... It just feels like, okay, well, once a year for six weeks, we're going to have a bunch of outside talent on these shows. We're going to have to real quick either give them a video package or get them a win over a jobber so that that you've seen them win a wrestling match before. We're also building 13 matches for this pay-per-view <laughs> across our five-plus hours of programming every week and you have to watch all of it and it just none none of this does anything for me i think forbidden door as a concept is dead and uh should not continue but that said uh hey mercedes has good wrestling matches so this should be fun sure in my opinion uh tony storm versus mina shirakawa mariah may uh, at ringside in both corners. Uh, I liked the angle they did where uh, Mina abso- accidentally knocked out Mariah on Dynamite this week, uh, even though it was one of two matches on the same show where b- both the men's world champion mm-hmm. and the women's world champion had can they coexist tag matches mm-hmm. on, on, on this program on Dynamite this week. Uh, but uh, hey, Tony versus Mina Shirakawa. I don't think anybody has... Uh, I, I would like to see the gambling odds for this match just because it has to be 57,000 to one that uh, Tony, <laughs> Tony retains the title. Yeah, I don't think that's uh, too in doubt, um, especially now that you've had it. If anything, it feels like maybe they should have done the opposite thing. Like Tony should have hit, been the one that accidentally hit Mariah. Because sure. then you set up, oh, is Mariah going to like get her revenge? uh on on tony for letting that happen or whatever but um and yeah i don't know i this stuff has been entertaining um apparently their quarter hours have done really well across this build so people are into this storyline for i'm sure completely non-perverted reasons and everyone involved is pretty entertaining so um yeah this is a stop on to what i think is going to be mariah may versus tony at wembley so uh yeah this is the next stop on that mariah is wrestling uh soraya as as i'm sure we were going to get to next 
uh, on the uh, on the pre-show in their own match. Mm. Uh, there's a ladder match for the vacant TNT title. Uh, Takeshita versus Briscoe versus Perry versus Dante versus Leo Rush versus El Fantasmo. Uh, for the vacant TNT title, uh, Dante Martin, let's just cross our fingers and uh, hope he doesn't get hurt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Leo Rush, we're rolling the dice again. Back in the fold. Stay very stable genius. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, it'll it. I'm sure it'll be a fun, spectacular match, and it sure seemed like they were earmarking this for, uh, for Jack Perry to win uh, at the start of the build for this. Though he has been largely absent from from television, I feel over the last few weeks. Um, not completely absent, but he's not getting a lot of focus but i do suspect that he will win the belt as he is the only thing resembling a push to act in this company uh that's holding the belt and hey when adam the actor is healthy in a few months he'll have a he'll have a heel champion to come chase for the for the belt he didn't lose fun uh yoda suji titan and Hiromu takahashi versus the lucha bros and mystico former Triple A guys teaming with a CMLL guy, former Triple A guys as the uh, the partisans I've been pointing out on social media all week. Just a fun pre-show match there with a bunch of good workers, as you mentioned, Mariah May versus Soraya on the pre-show in a Owen Hart tournament quarterfinal. And then uh, Chris Statlander and Momo Watanabe versus Willow Nightingale and Tam Nakano. Uh, a preview of uh, Stat versus Willow, uh, which is a Owen Hart Foundation tournament uh, semifinal match. So that is the Forbidden Door. Uh, Dynamite viewership rebounded this week. They were at 502,000 last week. They rebounded to like 680 this week. Uh, I would still not consider that a very good number. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, everybody's like, well, the uh, the the lead in really, really matters. And usually this episode, there's an episode of a 15 year old sitcom on that is the lead in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um Is it is it a good sign if like two hundred thousand of your viewers are only watching the show passively because it's what comes on the television after the a rerun of the Big Bang Theory? I don't know. Uh, yeah, it doesn't speak to great investment in what you are putting on the television currently. Certainly, um, as is evidenced by you know they were doing. 800 to 900,000 a year ago in at this time and they're now celebrating a return to 680,000. Um yeah, doesn't doesn't uh speak to the uh investment of the fans who are watching the show every week. And hey, you know, by all accounts, if this show trends the way every AEW pay-per-view has trended to date, they're still going to convert a not insignificant portion of this weekly audience to buy their shows and pay $50 for these for what we have just described as mostly a interpromotional B show for lack of a better term um, and a, a stepping stone on the way to their, their Wembley show in August. So, um, Hey, they're, you know, they're, yeah, it's not a great sign. It's, it's not a great sign that, um, whatever the competition is, they've they've gone up against NBA finals and NHL finals and whatever else might have hurt them last week and changes in lead-ins and whatever uh, before and their viewership did not drop to that degree. So um, yeah, I, I'd be I'd be a little bit concerned and uh, would and it's it's not something I think you can you cannot pin this on just, I know cord cutting is a thing and it is it has contributed, I'm sure, to the year over year losses, but not to this degree. And you really can't make that argument when 
there's another wrestling company on basic cable every week that's up so um yeah just to me it says that the people that are watching your show can really kind of take it or leave it at least watching it live you know we don't get like the dvr plus numbers or anything like that but as far as the people that watch it live which still seem to be you know whatever the demographic that watches live still seems to be the most coveted thing when it comes to advertising uh yeah that sounds sounds like a sounds like a problem that uh, i don't i don't know it's hard when you're in a when you're in a skid and it doesn't feel like anything's working i don't think there's a solution <laughs> but um i don't know that hiring a bunch more people from 2010s wwe and tna production is what i would do but um that's what tony's done for most of this year so we'll see so the um the demo writing this week was the second worst they've ever done coming off last week's worst that they've ever done mm-hmm. um they were and uh so over the last 10 weeks they've averaged a 0. 0.24 and 700,000 viewers total this week they did a 0. 0.22 and 680,000 viewers total so they were still below their recent averages even though they uh, were up from their disaster last week. And as you pointed out, we never get the the DVR numbers. We never get the live plus seven, the live plus three or the live plus seven. We only get the next day mm-hmm. knee jerk reaction uh, who watched the show live. And maybe it's just a matter of, hey, people are into other things right now and they're still watching this show in in great numbers on DVR two to three days later and I, I i just i don't know i don't know i don't know i well the only hot act on the show is will osprey mm. isolate that uh <laughs> the only hot guy they have is will osprey isolate that mm-hmm. they i i don't know i i think i think they're they have been good in the past at presenting uh, good wrestling matches and presenting stars, but I don't think that they've shown that they can make a star yet. And we'll see. I don't. I don't know if anyone has been elevated in the last five years. I, I don't. was thinking about that watching Private Party lose to Chris Jericho this week. <laughs> about it's... them beating the Young Bucks on like the second ever Dynamite, and how five years later they're still young up and comers. It's like, and Danny Garcia is still presented that way. And look, mm-hmm. I don't think he's Mr. Charisma, but you know, people seem to like him because he's polite, rarely late. Uh, but the, yeah, I, as they, they need to make some stars. Um, they need to build the show not around Chris Jericho and Christian Cage, in my opinion. Uh, one of several acts on the show that are winking at the audience. Uh, the Young Buck stuff does nothing for me. Um, the Young Bucks are in this heel authority figure, <laughs> promotional versus babyface authority figure uh, feud with Chris Daniels and Tony Khan on one side and the Young Bucks on the other. And like Mr. AEW, John Moxley had, never talks about this and doesn't care about it. He doesn't talk at all. When's the last time they let Moxley cut a promo at all? Has he cut a promo on television promoting his match with Tetsuya Naito? Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe one. I think he did one at the end of his match because he said he was going to kill him or something. <laughs> I I vaguely remember that. it was like after. I don't know if it was on uh, Dynamite or a Collision, but he beats he and you. I think it was whatever that first match where Yuta came back was. I think they did like an eight man with all the the Blackpool Combat Club guys. I also just think the Blackpool Combat Club has long since over state it's welcome um that's a fair that's more than a fair point i don't i don't think it's helping anyone's presentation to be in that group like i it's fine in the sense that it's again it's very much how new japan does things where everybody breaks off to have their singles feuds but also whenever you want to do a tag match on your show they have ready-made allies who all wear the same t-shirt as them to to put with them it's not it's not the end of the world but I don't think it's helping anything to have uh, Claudio like Claudio and Yuda could be a tag team on their own. I don't think that's the worst idea, but 
uh, the four of these guys together, I don't think is helping like the guys, at least that you think could actually still draw you money and be focal points of your show. That being Danielson, who is apparently going to wrestle his last full-time match in October and Moxley, who is still theoretically your number two or three biggest star. So yeah, you should probably, should probably let that guy talk more since most people agree that that's uh, the thing he is best at. Yep. 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 All right. Um, so big pay-per-view weekend this weekend, big pay-per-view weekend next weekend. Uh, enjoy the Forbidden Door, everyone. And uh, until next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Think of this here uh, debate tonight. Why is it taking place in June before the conventions? They oversold my flight both ways. Uh, and had to do the auction thing. And the flight there, they wanted three people off the plane, and they were gonna give you a voucher and get you on a Southwest flight that led left like an hour later. So, hmm. all things considered, that's not the worst deal in the world. Sure. Um, perhaps the best part being that you don't have to fly on a Spirit flight. Um. But uh, the way back uh, from Orlando to Baltimore, they needed six people off the plane. And there were no more flights that day. So that one took a little while. Um, That's problematic. Yeah. Miraculously, we ended up taking off close to on time. We were probably like 10 minutes delayed. Um, I think it came down to... Because, like, everybody, like, we're boarding, we're getting ready, and then, like, one of the flight attendants that was working the desk outside before you board, like, came hurriedly onto the plane and, like, called some people off the plane. So I guess they, at the last minute, decided to take whatever deal this lady asked for, which, as she was walking by, she said it was $700, and plus they were going to pay for a hotel. I was like, okay. I mean, there are worse, there are worse things to do, uh, I suppose, than get a seven hundred dollar flight voucher and get an extra paid day in uh, in Florida. Um, but it really just comes down to a thing that I don't understand, which is that in any other industry where uh, tickets are sold for seats <laughs> to a thing, yes. Uh, when the, when you're out of tickets to sell, you stop selling tickets. Right. Um, but airlines don't seem to abide by this rule. And in fact, intentionally do this quite regularly and then make it your problem as the passenger who bought a ticket to the flight, uh, make it your problem that they uh, that they sold too many tickets. When it seems like the problem is is with with the system itself and the fact that you have the ability to sell more tickets than you have seats. That seems like a bad, a bad system and maybe something that should be like illegal. <laughs> Is illegal too strong a word? Feels like it shouldn't be allowed. Like there's no question as to who the nominees are going to be, but I look this up like the last, two or three election cycles the debates have been in september and october this is the earliest presidential debate there's ever been what are we doing i don't have an answer for, <laughs> for that <laughs> um the only things i've seen about this is that there's apparently there's no audience and they're going to mute the other person when one of the guys is speaking um well, which surely that'll handle all the problems. Right. There'll be no issues. Um, and everyone will feel good about themselves and the country when it's over. Um, based on that.
yeah, I don't know. Like debates in general feel like a very antiquated uh thing in that there was a time when we weren't all constantly inundated by political messaging and directly marketed to through email and text message and social media by these people. And so these were like the chances a nationally televised debate was the chance to get your platform out there and what you were running on and introduce yourself to the public at large. Right. Uh, That's no longer something we need as a society. Um, And I, I just, I don't, I don't believe there is a great number of people who are under like nobody doesn't know what these two guys stand for at this point. Joe Biden's a thousand years old and he's been a politician for 500 of those years. And Donald Trump is the most famous person in the world, basically. And also has been also already has been a president and is constantly spewing everything he thinks and believes um, into a microphone. So uh, we don't, we don't, I don't, when they do those little focus groups on CNN after debate of undecided (laughs) voters, I'm like, this is fake. This is more bullshit than any pro wrestling show that has ever been on the air. The idea that you don't know, you cannot, there's no person that is so brain dead on this earth that they could not have made up their mind by now, unless they're just not going to vote at all, which is, perfectly reasonable response uh to those two guys uh like the idea that you're going to be convinced by them chirping at each other while jake tapper stands there with his fucking little glasses on (laughs) ridiculous his smart guy glasses oh yeah he's so smart this is uh uh, taking me back like uh, 27 years to uh, this was uh, you're making a Rush Limbaugh argument, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which is uh, undecided voters are not undecided. They're just attention whores. <laughs> yes, that is, that is my belief. <laughs> yeah. It, the one and only one time you got to hand it to Rush Limbaugh because I, <laughs> I do think he's like I said, I just don't buy that in modern time, because, again, even if you don't watch cable news even if you don't read whatever is left of the newspaper industry like it's there's they you can't escape this stuff anymore like the idea that you if you are going to vote that you could be swayed by a televised debate is unfathomable to me i try to keep on keeping on 